Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, bringing you worldwide experts from all areas of health and fitness. We cover training, nutrition, coaching, and mindset. Welcome your host, strength and conditioning coach, 2012 and 2013 CrossFit Games champ, Michael Cashew. Mind, body, brute. Hello and welcome back. My name is Mike Cashew and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week's guest is Brent Fakowski. Brent is a three-time CrossFit Games competitor, and he's placed as high as second. For about three years in a row, I believe, Brent competed at the CrossFit Regionals and was one or two spots away from competing. In 2016, I think I've got my facts right, in 2016, he went from not qualifying to suddenly being the third, uh, fourth place competitor, and he has stayed in that top two to four spot for the last three years. So he went from not qualifying to becoming one of the absolute best in the sport over the course of one year. And this is one of the most interesting shows I've done in a really long time because Brent is an incredibly thoughtful and methodical athlete. And he's one of the few that I've ever talked to that can truly articulate how he developed the mindset that he has and how he's become so successful. Most people, most people, most athletes aren't fully aware of how they got to where they are. And so there, it, it can be hard to learn from them sometimes. Brent is not one of those people. He can fully articulate what's going on in his mind, how he developed a lot of these things. And because of that, I think it's just such a rich podcast for learning. We talk a lot about his history growing up in sports, what he was like as a competitor growing up, some really big influences, some coaches that he had early on. We talk about his early years in the sport of CrossFit and how he almost quit after placing second at, I think it was the 2015 regionals. And then we get into his time competing at the CrossFit Games and he's got both just hilarious stories along the way, as well as some really inspiring ones. So like I said, this is one of my favorite ones in a while, and I know you guys are going to love it. Before we get started, if you would, please share this episode with a friend, leave me a review on iTunes, and hit that subscribe button. Enjoy the show, guys. Brent, the Professor Fakowski. What's up, brother? Not much, man. Uh, how you doing? Doing great, man. Like like we were talking about before the show, I think we're both getting ready to take some time off for Christmas. Uh, I always love this time of year. So just trying to wind down the year right now. How about you? Yeah, I'm good, man. Very similar. It's been, uh, it's been busy as it always is, even though I try to keep it as clean as I can. Everything becomes quite busy. And so it's, it's nice. I'm, I'm back home where I grew up with my family here, hanging out and a little less training. Um, it's kind of nice to be away from, you know, my, my actual home feels like there's a little more space. So it's good. Love it, dude. Did you watch the Dubai fitness championship this weekend? Uh, I did not. I, I watched the final event. Um, so I woke up knowing that it might be close between, uh, Sam Briggs and Jamie green. So I just watched it without looking at the results. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I, the men's was on right after. So I watched that. I didn't watch anything else. I kind of kept track of the scores a little bit and, um, you know, looked at a few workouts. I might go back and watch one or two workouts, uh, just to see like how those guys, you know, attack them and what they were capable of just mm -hmm. to get a bit of a frame of reference. But, um, like the, the 15 snatches, 15 clean and jerks for time. Uh, with like two fairly heavy, moderate, moderately heavy barbells, just kind of curious. I'm assuming everyone went like quick singles, but I'd be just curious to see how people sort of pace that because that's something that, you know, I think I do well on yet. I'm also like working on. So it'd, be, it'd just be interesting to see what those guys did. But other than that, no, not really. Gotcha. What are your thoughts? Yeah. on? I'm not sure if you saw this, but Fraser did an interview with Tommy Marquez and he said that he will be doing more of the events this year. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think it's a good thing. I think, you know, obviously Frazier has a lot of, uh, you know, right now he's 
he's the best male CrossFit athlete. And so if you can get him competing at more events, it's just going to drive up the viewership of those events and, you know, increase everything around the season. Um, and even for myself, my first plan to compete is in China at the Asia CrossFit Championships at the end of April. Mm-hmm. And I'm con- definitely considering doing another event, another sanctioned event after that. Whether or not I am, um, you know, the plan is obviously to win in China and punch my ticket there, but I might do another event just for the competition experience um, and, you know, just kind of to get out there and maybe make some more prize money. And I think that's probably the same for him. You know, it's from December to August is a pretty long time to go without maybe doing a competition just to kind of, you know, uh, dust off the dust off the competition shoes, so to right. speak. So I think it's good. And, and, you know, as a, I think you get better. I think you get better by training, you know, like in any sport, if you're in the gym, you're in your, your dungeon, you're training, you get better, but like, you can't live like that all year. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, you know, I, I don't, I'm sure, sure Matt knows what he's doing. Obviously if he went to every single sanctioned event, I feel like there'd be a little bit of blood in the water. Like that seems a little silly. I feel like he's going to be tired by the game, but I think he knows what he's doing and whatever he chooses, he'll still be, he'll still be very prepared in August. So I don't, I don't really think it's going to affect that, but I think it's good for the sport that he's interested in doing more events. You think there's any chance of him trying to pick specifically the events that guys like you and Velner are going to, to try and, I mean, there's no, there's zero risk of him doing that other than maybe being a little more tired, but if he should beat one of you, it makes his chances at the games even easier. Right. I mean, you know, they haven't released the rule book yet. My assumption is that once you qualify for the games, any spot you qualify in moving forward, whether like, let's say he wins the American open or he comes top 20 in the open, or he wins a sanctioned event. I would venture to guess now that his first spot is the one that counts. Mm-hmm. And then moving forward, any spot he was to get, uh, if he was to get another spot, it would go to the guy just behind him. That would be my assumption. But I mean, what he could do is, uh, and I've joked about this with people for years that the way our scoring system works is he could like strategically, win or lose specific events to change the outcome of the leaderboard and in the case of a very close race Uh at the top Uh that would be pretty hard to do and you know you're only one guy but i mean theoretically let's say you were uh you know team crossfit new york city and you had a bunch of like let's say a 10 male athletes that were all really good and you all qualified for the same sanctioned event and you went there and you had this like blood oath that okay like you know john is the chosen one and everyone just made sure they finished right behind John in every event mm-hmm. to create these log jams of points. Um, you know, so let's, if they could time it so that every guy finished like a second or two behind John, he right. would have a really high likelihood of winning um, as opposed to them all just going out there doing their best. And then the leaderboard would shake out. And maybe none of them would go. Right. But I don't, I don't, I don't know if one guy, <laughs> first of all, I don't think Frazier would do that because, you know, he'd much rather just win. Right. Uh, just like I would. And most people would, but there's the possibility for that. And there always has been. Um, yeah. So, but I, I don't know. I, I would, yeah. I mean, yeah, it would be funny if he could go to, or anyone could go to uh, multiple sanctioned events, win them and essentially block other people from winning them. Mm. But we'll see. Maybe, maybe that'll be the rule. That'd be, that'd be wild. Right. Yeah. Hopefully we'll see one of those one day. One of those rule books. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be good. <laughs> All right, man. I want to I want to dive in uh, to your story a little bit because I've I really haven't heard much about your past, and if I haven't, I'm sure a lot of our listeners haven't either. So, I'm curious, what were you like as a competitor growing up? I know you were really into swimming, so I feel like there's some there's some uh, some good stuff there. What, what were you like as a competitor, and who were your biggest influences? Um, that's a good question. I think so. I mean, I grew up playing lots of different sports. I primarily swam competitively every summer. So from the age of like six to 19 or 18, every summer I would swim competitively for four months. So there's this four month season. And then in the winter time for the other, uh, there's usually a, a blend there. So nine months, there were other sports, indoor sports. Um, but that became mostly volleyball by the time I was in grade like nine and 10. So it was basically just volleyball and swimming in the later parts of my life. Before that, it was Taekwondo and I don't know, baseball, soccer, whatever, mm-hmm. basketball. Um, so swimming, I had a lot of really good coaches. We had a good club 
And so every year or two, you'd get a different coach, learn something new from that coach. And I became very good. I was always good at breaststroke. That was always my go-to. And later, uh, as I got older, using two, like two hands at the same exact time over the center, right? Yeah. So you kind of like scoop in and then press out and you have this large, like a whip kick. So your feet aren't together. They go really wide. Um, which is one of the reasons I like I have flexible legs in certain positions and uh, that's part of it. Like my groin is quite flexible so I can squat quite wide. Always have been able to because of that. And um, yeah, so I was good at breaststroke and by the time I was like, I don't know, 14 or 15, uh, maybe it was 15, I was basically in, in this particular, you know, competition. I was the best in my province or my state. And so I kind of started started setting my goals on trying to break some records. So there was like a Lethbridge record and then there was a Southern Alberta record and there was a provincial record. And so each year from like 15, 16, 17, um, I was trying to break these records. And two years in a row, I came up like agonizingly short, which was pretty heartbreaking. And then the next year when I was 16 or 17, um, I kind of just went, tried to go all in on it. And um, I actually talk about this in the my documentary on YouTube, the All In, I think it was episode or with my swimming coach who was there and we chatted about it and um yeah just everything i did that summer i had i had a part-time job to make some money and i would wake up i'd train i'd bring food with me and then i would work for this kind of eight-hour job and then i would go back and i'd swim or i'd do dry land and so i was training you know i was in the pool getting wet like eight days a week nine days a week or nine sessions a week and dry land on top of that and just really really focused did everything the coach said you know, put effort into every rep when I was training, ate healthy or at least what I thought was healthy to a point where I think I didn't have uh, dessert for a month and a half. Wow. And I, yeah, yeah, because I was like, oh, like dessert's bad for you, right? Like, you know, <laughs> I know cookies aren't, you know, good. So I didn't eat that. Um, and to a point where I remember like a week or two before the big event, basically the only shot I had at him getting the record, um, I was at work. And there was all these donuts at someone's birthday and everyone was kind of agging me on to have a donut. And I was like, no, I don't really want one, you know? And, and I remember like two weeks later, I broke the record by two one hundredths of a second, which oh, is not a lot of time. And uh, I always like one of the, not the first thing, but within, you know, a day or two, like I thought back to that donut and I was like, maybe that donut was the reason like wow. if I had eaten a donut. Um, so I was pretty, pretty intense. And then on the volleyball court, kind of the same, um, you know, I was always one of the more focused guys. Like I didn't have a lot of, I had good games and great games. I didn't have a lot of like bad games, at least compared to my own abilities. And I would always show up to practice, like, you know, ready to practice. And I would be one of the harder, harder worker, hardest working guys in the gym. I think, Mm -hmm. um, didn't always have the most, uh, talent, I suppose, but had enough. And, um, yeah, I was usually one of the more, the louder guys too, um, where I would, Really, I'd be very vocal, and yeah, yeah, I'd cheer a lot and be very vocal when I was on or off the the floor. If I, you know, if I didn't have playing time, you know, mm-hmm. I was always kind of like trying to raise the morale. I think just the one of the teams I was on in particular um, that I kind of was on every second year like needed that. A lot of guys kind of kind of slow moving and hard to really like you know get to playing to their full abilities, and so I just kind of took on that role because I think I thought it was needed even though I didn't like revel in it but mm. um, just tried to be kind of the cheerleader of the team were you the team captain or leader whether, um, whether that was formal or informal yeah there there is a formal captaincy role uh not on all my teams I think a few when I was in grade 12 uh me and my my best friend Andy were the co-captains because mm-hmm. everyone else was in grade 11 that was on the team um but we were also leaders like it wasn't just you know, because we were older. Um, and then when we played club after that, so you kind of play in high school for three months and then club is like another five, five, mm-hmm. six. And I was, I think I was captain one year, or like co-captain or something. Um, yeah, you, you, I was, I kind of assumed somewhat of a leadership role. I wasn't always the, the best player. Most of the teams I played on, I, I had a starting role, but um, I wasn't always the the best player either. Um, gotcha. I wasn't the difference maker. And if we won or lost, and part of that was the, the actual position I played, I was in middle is kind of like playing, I don't know, like center in basketball. Um, you know, usually like shooting guards are going to usually make more of an impact. Um, but, uh, yeah. And then when I made it, to, I played on a college volleyball team. I got um, recruited. I had the opportunity to play at like 
basically there's one college that was interested here and then I didn't really look anywhere else. And then um, a university was interested in me swimming if I wanted to as well. And I chose chose volleyball, um, which I'm glad I did, even though I probably would have been a better university swimmer than a college volleyball player, but I was enjoying it more and better made, made more sense for what I wanted to do with academics. And I sat on the bench um, most, I played for two years and I was mostly sitting on the bench. My second year, I maybe could have got more time, but I had a, I worked really hard in the summer to get in better shape. Mm -hmm. And I came into the, the new season in much better shape and much more conditioned and just a little, I had to up my skills by playing beach volleyball all the time. But mm -hmm. then, uh, I got an injury from work where I like slipped and fell and bruised a rib. So I like, couldn't like jump or Damn. do anything for, like two months. And then the guys kind of caught up to me and I was short. Um, you know, I, it, it would have, like, I think I would have got some time at the beginning of the season, but the other guys still would have probably over overtook that position just cause they were like, I'm six, two and they were like, you know, six, eight. So matter of time. <laughs> right. Was that, so, something that sticks out to me is how focused you were at a really young age and because yeah. I grew up really, really into sports, but it wasn't, it definitely wasn't the culture in most teams I played on to work, just work really hard, right? We played really hard and we were, we were very tough, but we didn't know how to focus. It wasn't part of the culture to, you know, get extra reps after practice or any of that kind of stuff. So was it, was it a cultural thing and it was just kind of the norm for people to behave that way or, or were you, uh, unique in that? A bit of both. I think, um, you know, I always kept myself too busy. Like when I was in grade 11 and 12, I was getting good grades and I was studying and I was, I played guitar and like, you know, organized like music rock concerts for like all the bands. And I just did like way too much. Um, mm -hmm. I was always super busy. And then, uh, which is, you know, good, but that's just, it was just how I was. And I always put like a hundred percent into whatever I was focusing on mm -hmm. at the time. But part of that was definitely instilled by, you know, like the swim club had like good coaches and there were, you know, a few athletes older than me that were, you know, focused as well, maybe not quite as focused, but I looked up to them and I wanted to, you know, impress them or, you know, be like them. And then definitely, definitely in volleyball, like when I was in grade 10 and, I moved up to the senior team just to like be there for the weekend and they, um, they won or no, sorry, they, they got silver at provincials and their level of focus and practice. And like, they were super cool dudes and they were just these like really nice guys that like trained incredibly hard and did exactly what the coach said. And you know, that it was a culture thing. Right. And then when they left and I was in grade 11 and then grade 12 and that like culture of, winning and working hard and focusing when you play and focusing in between games. And, you know, we did like mental training, um, two times a week with the head coach, we'd like be in a classroom and we'd visualize together and we'd do all these drills and we'd have like, like motivational buddy, like on the court. So it was like your responsibility to keep each other, like, like with a high motivation tank. And so you had to like identify when they weren't doing well and like learn strategies to help them. And sometimes it was like a secret. Sometimes it was, wasn't a secret and you knew and all these different things. Um, yeah. So we were like, you know, the, the coach that we had instilled like a really high level of professional like work ethic. And wow. it, you know, I mean, from, from those, so those guys graduated in 07. So from the guys that graduated in 07 to the guys that graduated in 2011, I think like 80% of them went on to play college or university volleyball mm -hmm. or more, um, which is super high. Um, yeah, there's just this work ethic. And it, I talked about this somewhere else once, but I didn't realize until I left. Like, So my friend and I, we moved to Australia, my best friend and I, and we played volleyball there. We played indoor. And this one particular game, we kind of on this like club team – and we were down by a bunch of points and we came back down again, came back down again, came back. And we ended up winning this game after being down two sets to none and you had to win five sets. So it was unlikely, right? Finished the game. And this Australian that was on our team, young guy who was like 18, we were 21 at the time. He said, oh man, I can't believe we, we pulled that out. Like I thought we were going to lose for sure. And my friend and I, we looked at each other and looked at him. We're like, I, I still remember this. I was like, what do you mean? It's like, well, like we were down by a bunch of points and we'd lost the first two sets. Like, you know, we were going to lose. And uh, my friend and I, Andy, were like, well, but we like, no, like we won, like we always win. And it was this attitude that we had 
without even really realizing it, like he wasn't instilled with this like winner's attitude. Right. And so familiar with it from volleyball. So we had a season where we won uh, 59 games in a row when we were in grade 11 and we Jesus. won the state championship, which is like unheard of. And it was amazing. And, uh, you know, cause we just go into these games kind of not brainwashed, but just no matter we, we just ride out the waves and eventually we just always seem to win. <laughs> and, uh, and then the next year we didn't have, we didn't win 59 games in a row, but we, we did really well. And then what happened was we all left. And I think like two, three, four years later, that, um, culture was still there on that team because of that coach, but because those young players grew up watching us, mm-hmm. they practice with us, they grow up. And these teams that had really no business winning as many games as they did, like won a lot of games just because they were relentless and they just went out there with this, like, you know, this kind of like, you know, good, strong confidence. But yeah, you know, we're going to go out there and like, you know, when you play volleyball, you usually win the game. Like that's just kind of how you do it. And <laughs> for no other reason than that. And when you're that young and, you know, if you're another team that's used to losing to that same team, mm-hmm. um, you know, it makes a big difference. And yeah, I think like that's something that um, was definitely instilled in me that just that like confidence, like, yeah, if you like work really hard and give your best, like most of the time you win and that's just how it is. Man, that's such a huge competitive advantage to have those, to learn those lessons and to imprint that into your brain over and over and over for those kind of formative years. Yeah, it's super cool. I, I, you know, I've only, I realized it a couple of years ago, really it was kind of after that conversation with that guy in Australia, which was three years after I'd graduated from high school. Mm-hmm. And I started to realize like, wow, you know, not everyone is like, you know, me or Andy or these guys I grew up with playing volleyball where, you know, we just had this like, oh, well, you know, yeah, sometimes we don't get as many points the first bit, but we always win. It's fine. (laughs) He didn't, he didn't under, you know, he didn't have that. And if if I realized like the outcome of that game, if it was left in his hands, we would have lost. Right. And because, and he, you know, he's just as skilled as us, but the outcome of the game was primarily in. Andy in my hands just because the roles we played and some other players that had a similar mindset. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, you know, Andy went on like this big serving run because he had to, you know, he didn't have a choice. It's like, you have to serve like five in a row here. Right. Um, And then we have to play defense around that. And we just, you know, we found a way. Um, Yeah. So it's, it's interesting that that's, yeah, it's kind of been, uh, you know, yeah, something like I learned and, you know, had sort of ingrained in me knowing that like, it's possible to win and it's not a scary thing to have the opportunity to win. It's like what's supposed to happen. Right. Yeah. I I think people tend to fall into one of two camps, either a, they don't have the skill level, but they do have the confidence and that's not earned or they have the skill level and they put in the work, but they don't, they have this like self limiting belief that can hold them back. Or do you have any thoughts on, people any thoughts for people that put in a lot of work but they really don't have the track record of success that you guys had um right to build that level of confidence is, is there anything that they is there a fast track or a way that they can move in the direction of having that level of confidence i have a i have a cool story to tell about that i'm not sure if it'll help but uh <laughs> i told this same the same kind of story uh at a speech once in this um this other type of setting, this business setting. And someone asked me that question and I said, I don't really know how to get that. And he, and so then someone else in the audience actually offered this suggestion. He said he would, he had an interior design business. He was struggling to get leverage and he knew he had the ability to, to really like accelerate his business. But it's like, there was this belief issue and he went on to ancestry.com and he found out that his like, I don't know, his great uncle was from like Spain or something like that or Portugal and was this very successful businessman. He, you know, like made boats or, you know, maybe he did even design himself and he was this artist and he did all this stuff for like princes and kings and politicians. And he was a politician for a while. He owned all these business, super successful guy. And so this guy said, like what he used is he used that to hack his mindset. And he said, like, it's in my blood to be successful, Mm -hmm. right? Like my great uncle was this really cool guy. He was very successful and I'm, I'm like him and he's like me and I belong in that realm of people. And it completely turned his business around being able to approach others confidently 
being able to say like, this is what I can provide you. This is what I'm charging you. It's worth that. In fact, it's worth more. And you're not going to regret working with me, that kind of confidence and Mm -hmm. completely transformed his business. He wasn't doing anything differently. Um, Like functionally, it was all just in that. And so I think you need to, if, if you don't have that, and I mean, you know, I, I, I lack that sometimes too, right? It's something that comes and goes or some days it's stronger, some days it's weaker. And you have to remind yourself of reasons why you are successful and, you know, you can draw upon actual reasons that you, you know, things went well for you, like actual times you won and proof that, you know, your hard work directly correlated to that success. Or, you know, you might have to get something a little more fanciful or um, like, like his, where it's like really obviously his great uncle's success has absolutely nothing to do with his own, right, right. but he was able to convince himself that it did. And, you know, there might be something, something to that effect where you can, find some strange reason why you know you did de- you deserve you deserve to win as much or more than anyone else right i heard a i heard a really interesting i heard something interesting recently by james altucher he said failure he, he basically called bullshit on the whole fail fast adage and he said that f- because failure is one of the most destructive things to our confidence and this i mean it's certainly not a black and white statement but it really it really taught me something it taught me that in every like we need to be setting ourselves up to win as often as possible and we don't we don't need to do that at the expense of doing challenging things but we need to set ourselves up to win and we need to treat competition with a lot of respect because like any competition, because that's going to have a huge, huge role on our level of confidence. So one thing, one thing mm. that you can do is start small, right? Don't just go straight to trying to compete in the CrossFit games, compete in some local ones, build up your confidence. And the other, the other half of it is work really fucking hard do everything yeah. that you can to reach your goals and you're going to start to build actual self-esteem. Um, there, there's no, there's no shortcut or fake to self-esteem and confidence. Yeah. I really like that. I think that, yeah. I, yeah. The idea of, oh, I'll just, you know, like go to a competition and like just experience it and have a go. Um, like I never do that. I never have, you know, I've never went to, like any competition I can think of in the last freaking 27 years where I wasn't going there, like fully preparing to give everything I had to do my best. Mm -hmm. Um, doesn't mean I didn't, I didn't win all of them. Right. But I didn't go into any of them and especially not now, but you know, it's, it's like people, you know, if you do like a local kind of throwdown, um, which is totally fine to do, but it's like, if, I, if I'm going to do something like that, like I'm going to prepack my food, I'm going to have, even if it's like a two day taper, I'm going to visualize the events, I'm going to get good night's sleep, I'm going to extra hydrate, I'm going to stress out a little more that week, I'm going to get there early, I'm going to look at the venue, I'm going to visualize, you know, I'm going to do all those things because it's practice for when that matters. You can't just say, oh, you know, it's just like another workout and you just kind of go and have a go. And mm-hmm. it's like, well, then w- w- what was the purpose of that? Right. You know, like why? Oh, you know, like I learned something. I'm like, yeah, but you know, you... Why not like prepare for that as though it's the biggest competition ever? And then you'd really learn something. Right. Because then you'd learn, oh, like, you know, I failed at these specific points and I wasn't prepared enough here instead of like going completely unprepared, just crushing some workouts. And then the next time you actually prepare, you're not, you're not doing the same thing. You're going to run into a completely new set of challenges mm-hmm. that you're not. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I really like that. I think, yeah, like the whole fail fast thing. I mean, you know, in some, in some instances, maybe if you're, you know, a business that has, um, I don't know, like a lot of capital or something, you know, you might want to like hit the market quickly right? and that might be inevitable, but from like a sporting perspective, yeah, I think that, you know, you need to set yourself up for success and work hard and work smart and, you know, you know, choose, choose every step wisely, not, not out of fear, but just out of, um, out of professionalism and, the desire to be good. <laughs> right, exactly. So let, let's fast forward. So you've, at some point you get into CrossFit and I know that at least for three years in a, in a row, you were really close to qualifying for the games, but did not What, what was that kind of chapter of your life like? And then how did that ultimately change? 
And like, how did you go on yeah. to qualify? So right around actually the time of that story with that, uh, the volleyball player in Australia, that was halfway through me competing, um, in CrossFit. So I had found CrossFit there. Um, actually, I just realized the other day I'd actually, there was a possibility that I would have started CrossFit a year earlier, but, um, the gym here in Lethbridge, when I lived here, I was working like two jobs to try to save money to Australia and the gym didn't open soon enough for me. So I couldn't train at a CrossFit gym. So I was training at like a local uh, university gym and, mm -hmm. you know, do, doing squats and burpees, but definitely I look back, I'm like, wow, I wonder if I had somehow made that work if I'd right. be a lot better. Um, anyway, uh, it's funny how that is. Um, so I went to Australia, I found CrossFit and immediately, you know, I think I, you know, it was expensive gym membership for me as a student. So as soon as I started paying it, I was there five, six days a week mm -hmm. immediately and, you know, was doing whatever the coach said and more. And pretty quickly I found I had an aptitude for it and was, you know, going to local comps and team events and all these things in the area. And I made regionals. Uh, the goal was just to, you know, go hard and kind of see what happened. And I came sixth. And so that year you needed to be top three. I wasn't really in the mix with those top three spots that year, but mm -hmm. still was like confidence booster that there was obviously like, I knew I had so much room to grow and, uh, you know, still placing that high was pretty cool. Sure. And then, yeah, I moved back to Canada, had a bit of an off training year. I, I, you know, was moving a lot and finding a new job and I had like pretty bad patella tendonitis, so I couldn't really squat for, you know, months. And then, um, went to regionals, kind of the same goal. I just wanted to sort of, you know, show Canada West that I was, you know, here to play and they had a new guy that was ready to compete and found myself in a position where I almost qualified. I was a couple points away from the top two, which is what you need to be that year. And yeah, that, that wasn't, I mean, it was, it was more just a shock that I was actually that close to making it mm -hmm. in a region that historically was as competitive and in some ways more competitive than Australia had been for the males. So it was just sort of this, you know, excitement for the coming season that I knew I had what it would take to make it if I just put in a solid year of training, which was a possibility based on my schedule. And then the next year of training went well. This was leading into the 2015 regionals. And I just started to put too much pressure on myself. I started to focus on the results. I was on Instagram looking at, you know, what my competitors were up to. It turned into the super regional, which was, you know, a little, little more added stress, just different competitors, different venue, traveling to the States, sort of less spots in a way. Um, and yeah, by the time I got there, I was just very high, strong, very stressed and put myself in a position by the end of day two where I was actually sitting in first. But by the last day, you know, my energy levels were so low because I had exerted so much like emotional energy before and after and between every event that, uh, you know, things just kind of fell apart on the last day. I was sort of running on fumes and also, you know, yeah. What was Sorry. that pressure about? Was it, was it, you knew how close you were the year before and you thought you should qualify? What, what was that all about? You know, it was just, yeah, I mean, I was just, um, just training really hard and I was working a full-time job and I just felt like no one else understood me. And I was just like, just felt like I was wrestling and losing to this imaginary beast every day. Right. And yeah. And it just, and like, you know, I, I wanted to to do more and give more and, and every training session that was good, wasn't good enough. Cause I, ah, oh, you know, someone else did that unbroken or every session that was bad. It was the end of the world. Cause I'm like, Brent, like, you know, if that session went bad, you know, you needed, you need to get better at those things. And that's not a good sign. And, you know, it was just like, I wanted to win. I wanted to make it across the games and I knew it was a possibility. Mm -hmm. And I felt that, you know, what I was doing, you know, wasn't enough, even though it was, it just felt like, you know, oh, someone else is doing more, this kind of just self-defeating. Yeah. Just stressed out of my mind Got type it. thing. Yeah. And what do you mean by people don't, didn't understand you? What didn't they understand? I think, uh, I think sometimes when you, when you're trained, like, you know, no one else in, in, I guess, Kelowna really was, was going to regionals was training the same way I was. And when I was at, sometimes when I was at work or even when I was at the gym, you know, people wanted me to 
I felt I kind of had this like, like this veil on of, of, I just felt like every movement I made was, was very deliberate and important. And I almost, maybe I kind of envied other people that seemed to be having more fun. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and I just felt like, you know, I, I wasn't, I didn't have the space to do that. I didn't, I didn't have the freedom in my life, in my time to, to have fun. And I think, you know, them wanting me to have fun. I was like, you don't get it. Like I can't, you know, I, I need to do this. I need to train. I need to train harder. I need to train more. I need to sleep. Um, you know, I can't have that food. I need to do this. And, and I, I think people did understand, or it's not even that. I think that what I realize now is, you know, the life of like a really competitive athlete, you can't expect people to fully understand what it's like. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not for them to understand. And that's completely fine. Some people do, you know, like obviously like my wife does. And then, you know, people I compete against understand because they're doing it too. But yeah, I think that that was the feeling. It's it's not, I realize now, and even from like a, like a CrossFit fan perspective, if you get someone realize like someone will comment on some post or you'll see some comment somewhere and you realize like part of me wants to like explain to them you know they might say something about you know someone like maybe it's some female competitor like oh why did she you know do that and you know these experiences are for me to experience and for other people to interpret however they want to interpret them and mm. not my job to get them to understand and i shouldn't expect them to right and that just that's you know that's it and so i think like i didn't really have the the understanding of of like that and what that meant and right yeah i just really you know i wanted to win and i was putting a pressure in the wrong places and was focusing you know i was kind of always thinking about like what my competition might be doing or how good they were and how i wasn't potentially stacking up to what they were capable of or i wasn't making progress fast enough mm -hmm. Yeah, just kind of overwhelmed me for for the months leading into uh, the twenty fifteen regional. Gotcha. And so I'm. Um, I don't know if you finished that story. I'm. I'm guessing you didn't qualify that yeah. year. I did not. No, I was. I was a hair shy. So I was first after two days. But it was all it was, the leaderboard was incredibly tight. And then I lost some ground in the strict handstand push up workout. Mm -hmm. You know, because I was fatigued. But also I just you know still wasn't as good as those as I should be. And then the next event was this sprint with uh, 15 muscle ups and five squat cleans, yep. you know, kind of like the speed clean ladder. And I just didn't have the urgency in that. I think mindset wasn't right going into it. And I was just kind of running on fumes and was a little timid and didn't fail any, but then, you know, finished and was a couple points shy. And there was, I think I ended up coming seventh out of, and I needed to come top five, but I, you know, I was like, five points or six points away from second place so second through seventh were just like really thick and it just yeah cookie didn't crumble in my favor that day mm -hmm. so what happens after that man I, I think this was your big transformation year yeah it was yeah i mean for a couple of months i was i was fairly depressed i think you know i was thinking about it a lot and it I, the year before when i didn't make it i was over it in 24 hours and i was just ready to train uh, that year was not the case. I just kind of kept dwelling over it. And I think it was just the, the amount of emotional pain it caused me and my wife um, after the event. I was scared of experiencing that again. Mm -hmm. And it was this feeling of like, I don't know if I can do that again. Like, I don't think I can go through that same year of training and how hard the year of training was and how much I felt I had to dedicate and sacrifice for that. Mm -hmm. And then for it to end in such a painful way, I just thought, I don't think I can do that. Um, and I considered like maybe looking into some other sport like rowing or just doing something else, but I kept training and things got better. Uh, and then I actually called up my old volleyball coach from high school, uh, call him, sent him a message and asked him, you know, his advice. I said, you know, I want to like have this, yeah, yeah. Um, cause we worked a lot on mental training stuff and just thought he'd be the guy to ask and said, okay, you know, the physical stuff's coming back together. And, you know, I want this like mental piece to be stronger. And I know it was lacking last year. That was definitely part of the issue. What, uh, you know, I want to have this unwavering belief that I can win this coming year. Like I know if I just believe like 110% that I can win, that it's going to happen because it's right there. The physical parts there need the mental part to follow. And he just sent me a quote um, from this book that uh, basically said, the, you need to release the outcome. You need to surrender the outcome that you could fail. And only when you realize that are you 
free to do your best, free to compete at your best. Mm -hmm. And related to like a soldier or warrior, like the man you want next to you in battle is the one that knows he could die. And it's that soldier that will be, you know, freed and is ironically the one that has the the greatest likelihood of survival because he's not afraid to do what he needs to do. Badass. Yeah, it was awesome. And uh, it was like, man, I remember reading that and I can, it just felt like this weight had been lifted off my shoulders. Mm -hmm. Like, like it was exactly what I needed to hear. Um, I had, I think I was trying to instill this sort of like a fighter's mentality that you hear at press conferences where they're just so dead fast that they're, they're going to win. Like right. their steadfast belief that I'm going to win. I'm going to knock this guy out. Like there's just no other way that this can go. And I was trying to figure that out and maybe emulate something like that. And then I realized I was in the back of my mind. I, I didn't, I wasn't capable of that because I knew like, I mean, I just lost. Right. So I like, right. I knew I could lose again. <laughs> it's very possible. And this sort of allowed me to just focus on training and focusing on being the best version of myself and realizing that, you know, the year of training had to be worth it on its own, even if the result, you know, wasn't what I wasn't what I wanted, wasn't in that top five or in that first position. Um, and yeah, and then the year of training went a lot better from like a mental standpoint and was able to just, uh, yeah, focus on being me. And when I got to the competition, I had, you know, done a lot of mental preparation, you know, focused on just executing every event exactly as I planned not worrying about everyone else. And I just, it was like, I, it was in, in some ways is the best, actually, no, not in some ways, it, best comp- competition I've ever had where I was so in the zone, every event, usually you get like one or two workouts like that, where you're mm-hmm. just in this kind of like dreamy space where it seems effortless and you're just very in touch with how you're feeling and just like freeing, um, almost not an out-of-body experience, but you feel like your body's like this machine that's doing the work and you're kind of in there just as a spectator. And because I was so prepared for all these events, um, every event felt like that, felt effortless. I, you know, PR'd almost all the events mm-hmm. from what I did in training and did it easily. And then in the end of the weekend, I won with like, I think almost over 100 points and yeah, went to the CrossFit Games. <laughs> that's a fucking cool story, man. That's the, that's yeah. the definition of flow state for those of you who, or who are listening, um, just being so prepared and allowing yourself to let go of that outcome is fast track to flow state. It's so funny that you bring up that quote today. Yesterday, I was reading something that Sean White said. And oh, yeah. For those of you who don't know Sean White, he's the best snowboarder of all time, two time gold champion um, snowboarder. And he was, he picked up something from Andre Agassi, who's one of the best tennis players of all time. Before Andre would go out on the court, he would think to himself, no matter what happens in this match, I'm going to be back with my family tonight. And he's basically Mm. doing what you have done, right? Which is kind of let go of needing to win or needing to be any certain way to, I don't know, feel, uh, and I'm putting words in your mouth here, but feel worthy or to feel whole, right? You're, you're saying, I'm just going to do my best and that's all I can literally do. Um, and both of those guys have, have used that. And so it's, it's funny to hear you say that today. Yeah. I've actually heard another cool quote by Sean White talking about flow space, uh, flow. Um, sorry, (laughs) there's a, there's a company in Kelowna called float space and that's where I do a lot of my visualization. Um, but, uh, yeah, achieving the flow state and Sean White, he, there's a quote of him in this book I've read, um, called the mindful athlete by George Mumford, I think. And he says the flow state, it's like, it's this, when you're in the flow state, you have like this unbelievable amount of focus, but you also don't really care. And so it's like this dichotomy Mm -hmm. of, um, you know, like you're so focused, but you're also like, eh, you know, like it's all good. And, uh, I definitely experienced that. I like, there was an event at, um, at the regional that year where it was, uh, Nate. So it was just like 20 minutes. You do like a couple muscle ups, handstand pushups, you run forward, you kettlebell swings, but it was slow. Like, you know, you had to really pace it cause it was strict muscle ups. And I remember like being super focused, sticking to my plan and jogging to my kettlebell and I could hear my wife and my, my parents like cheering. And I was like, Oh, you should like turn over and just like wave to them 
And I'm, nah, nah, you shouldn't. And I was like thinking that as I was, as I was picking up this kettlebell and like the middle of these rounds, like super, super focused, doing exactly what I needed to do. Yet, like I had that, you know, I, I was doing that and it was the same, uh, it was the same feeling I had when I was, when I was swimming and I broke that record where I was swimming and I was thinking, geez, I wonder, like, I wonder if I could stop right now and like just move my hand like back and forth and like, no, no, I probably shouldn't. And then I touched the wall, did a perfect flip turn or a um, tumble turn. And, uh, you know, like, I was having this like sort of just internal, like almost humorous dialogue with myself in the most, you know, important, you know, event of, of both of those at that point in my life, the most important competition I'd ever had. And I was just like thinking about other things yet still completely executing exactly what my body needed to do because in both of those cases i'd mentally visualized those events multiple times and even really performed them maybe not in that particular uh you know stage but like in the gym or in the pool i'd done it multiple times i knew how exactly how many strokes i needed to take to get to the wall so it's mm-hmm. been kind of an autopilot but yeah it's funny that yeah that's that's what and those moments are um you know those flow state moments are like the moments that mean everything like the, it's kind of worth the whole year with or without a, a medal or anything to experience those cool little moments that are just yours. You know, you can't catch those on camera. Right. Oh, that's awesome, man. So you finally cro- qualify for the CrossFit games. What was, I know you have a funny story about the uh, first event. Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. So the first event was uh, the seven kilometer trail run and you know, which was a good event for me. Like I like running. And so, you know, I had a strategy, just the kind of general pacing strategy and, um, went hard. And so by the end of it, um, I'm sure people have seen the video of me at the end running with this like awful, like high knee technique, um, trying to hold off. I don't think I quite, no, I didn't, I didn't hold off Sam Briggs. Um, not that it mattered for points <laughs> during, during that, like, you know, I had, I paced that event very well. Uh, to a point where by the end I was, I was a complete mess. Like I couldn't talk. I involuntarily peed in my pants, which has never happened to me before. <laughs> and, you know, and so I remember Sam Briggs was passing me and I remember this, like there was some open announcement and in my mind I was like, Oh, you know what? Like I remember when Froning went up against Sam and he like let her win, like it's okay. But it was actually the other way around. <laughs> where Sam was ahead uh, and then throwing after and after the event, she said something like, Oh, you know, uh, you know, he kind of made this push and I let him win. Like, it doesn't matter kind of thing. And so I, I had Froning's voice in my head, like saying like, no, nah, it's fine, man. Just let her pass. I'm like, thanks, man. <laughs> and then, and then, but the, so I finished and then I was this, I was this mess, man. I had to go to the medic tent and I had to cool off. Like I couldn't eat and I was trying to get ice in a bag and put it on my head. And I like, just like my, I couldn't figure it out, like how to do that. Um, and everyone else was warming <laughs> up to do a deadlift. Yeah. And I was like, man, I'm not okay. Like I'm going to be that guy that pulls out after the first event. Like I was really scared uh, because I just like wasn't functioning. Um, never, never had been like that before. And, and then, you know, miraculously I kind of recovered enough and I said, okay, you're going to go out there. You're going to deadlift the opening bar, which was like 425. Like you can do that cold. if You had to, and then just, call it quits and then keep recovering and you can keep going. So I kept feeling better. And so I'm usually like a very methodical guy in my warm up, but that day I didn't have time. So it was, I think like I just got out of the medic tent and I had like, I don't know, five, six minutes. So I think I deadlifted 225, 315, 365, put on the belt, pulled like, you know, 395. And I was like, all right, 425, like just like in the line. And I ended up PRing my deadlift. Amazing. Um, yeah, 485 at the time was the PR. And it was just, just you know, nuts, right? And, and I remember telling that story about, like, how I was peeing myself and couldn't couldn't see to Lucas Parker. And he said, uh, he goes, welcome to the game. Like, that's, <laughs> like, nothing can prepare you for, you know, the kind of, like, level of effort you push yourself to in the heat. And, yeah, you know, like, because he's had some issues with, like, heat stroke and stuff at the right, games as well. Right. Um, and I was like, yeah, I guess, I guess this is, this is the, this is the event this is what I've been training for. Um, and then I gave that, yeah, I gave that same kind of little, little welcome to the game speech to Jared Enderton this year. I think he, he had a bit of a rough go at, I think it was in the bike race or something. He's like, man, you know, everyone was so close and I made a little mistake here and there and I almost fell and, and I'm like, yeah, welcome to the games. Like it's, 
it's a tough go out there, man. And before you know it, all your, all your dreams are going to come crumbling down or, or you're not going to let that happen. But right. yeah, it's like, it's this crazy things happen like really, really fast. And then all of a sudden there's this feeling of like, I don't know, they're kind of like cemented into, uh, not that it's that important, but like into like a, into legacy or whatever. Right. Um, you know, like I still get people talking about that, that running with Sam brings in my, the only thing I could think of was like high knees, like keep your, literally I was thinking high knees. I thought of some cue just like came out of like just some coach I used to have, like just keep your knees high. And you yes. cause I was like struggling just to walk and I didn't want Hefner to catch me. I wanted to get a grand cause I came in third in that event. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, re- and then, I remember you know, it, man. I remember those high knees. Oh yeah. They're good. Really good. Oh, that's yeah. so funny, dude. That's my, little, that's my little story. That's my first, my introduction to the CrossFit Games is voluntarily peeing and, you know, I couldn't talk and I was like trying to, I remember trying to put like water or ice into like a bag and I just like couldn't figure it out. I'm sitting there and then I'm looking around, people were warming up to the deadlift, like talking and laughing. I'm thinking, Brent, you're not okay. Right. <laughs> like you should be up there and like you're you're not functioning and everyone else is like something's wrong (laughs) yeah man plastic bags these days are harder than they look oh yeah yeah they've made a lot of improvements since 2016 oh yeah so (laughs) i think you i think you went on to get third or fourth that year is that right yeah fourth just behind belner yep and then the next year third or fourth again yeah second second okay what was it like for you going from you know, just two or the year before having that, that period where you were questioning if you, if you even wanted to stay in the sport to suddenly being in the top five and then the top five again, what was that like mentally for you? Yeah, that was, um, cool. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, I bet. Yeah. You know, yeah, it was, um, it was good. And I think, yeah, it was really good. It was interesting. Like, I think, you know, I knew it was possible, just like I knew I could qualify for the games. And then by the time I qualified, and I kind of look at the, you know, so I did qualify, I won my region, and going into the 2016 games, they made like a combined leaderboard with all the regional scores. And so on that leaderboard, I think I was like eight, um, maybe seven. And I thought, well, you know, I'm better at running and swimming and odd objects and pulling sleds and all that kind of stuff than I am at this traditional CrossFit, which was 2016 regionals was very traditional CrossFit, lots of barbell, lots of gymnastics. So I thought, you know, there's no reason to think that if I'm seventh or eighth here that I couldn't be like fifth or third or even first or something. So I went into the games that you're thinking like, if I just do my thing, I'm probably going to be in that top mix of athletes Mm -hmm. like I I was pretty pretty sure that that was like I wasn't basically the way I put it to people was if I if I go to the games and I do my best and I come last like I'm not going to be unhappy but if I go there and I you know and in that top mix I'm not going to be surprised and that's so it was kind of by the time I'd really wrap my head around that idea for the months leading into the games and so when it happened it just felt like you know it was you know, it was meant to happen, mm-hmm. but it what it is surreal. Like, I mean, you know, now it's surreal looking back, remembering conversations I had with people in my first year of CrossFit, especially like people talking about regionals in the games. And I remember saying like, Oh man, I'll, those guys are crazy. Like I'll never be at the games level. Um, and you know, now here we are and there's, you know, sometimes I'll meet some kid or something and I'm his favorite CrossFitter in the same way I would have approached a, like Graham Holmberg or something. Right. And even now I've, I haven't posted the video yet, but I snatched 305 when Damn. I was in Salt Lake. Yeah. Nice and, uh, job, man. <laughs> that's cool. And, you know, I remember snatching 225 for the first time in 2012, thinking like, all right, I got the keys to the city now. I'm, right. I'm the king. And, <laughs> you know, like put my name in, in, in bronze, like make a statue of me, like it's over. They just uh, <laughs> automatically make you mayor at that point, right? Yeah. Yeah. You made it. Yeah. Back then it was cause you know, 2012 had the snatch ladder and kind of like the 225 was this sort of line. If you cross that line, then, you know, you were, you know, it was, it was good enough to maybe even make the games with 225 back then. Uh-huh. Um, and so I made that and I was like, sweet. And you know, if you would have told him I was 22 at the time, 21, like Brent, like one day you'll snatch 305. Like I would not have believed you. Like simply I would have been like, you are definitely like, no, there's just no way. 
Um, so it's pretty cool to think, um, to think back to that and to think now that I'm like a, you know, and hopefully continuing to be sort of like a staple name in that, um, that mix of top, top men at the games, which is, um, yeah, it's cool. Um, I'm trying not to forget how, uh, how, how fortunate I am to have, you know, put myself in that position. And, you know, obviously like I, I put myself there, but there's, there's some, some things involved. There's some, uh, privilege there that, you know, sure. had nothing to do with what I did. So it's, yeah, I'm lucky. Yeah. I mean, any, any success has that some, some, some level of, you know, chance and timing and luck, but it also has a ton to do with all of the hard work that all the hard work that you put in for many, many, many years that have led to this point of you, you know, it seems like you suddenly got into the spotlight, but it, it all comes from this groundwork that you've been laying for the last 15, 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I, yeah, I definitely appreciate that and believe that that's the, you know, the reason, but at the same time, like I, you know, grew up in a stable house with really great parents, you know, instilled values in me that, you know, so like I was already ahead of the game, so to speak. And, you know, I, it was nothing but luck that put me in that high school with that particular volleyball coach and those swimming coaches and all those things. Right. You know, and even, even the coaches that I happened to get starting CrossFit and continue to have, there's, certain elements of luck there that you know other people stumbled into not great gyms maybe and mm-hmm. you know, had to start at a deficit and now they're building back and all these things so yeah no i'm uh yeah definitely aware that there's some luck involved but also yeah there's a lot of people that you know have a lot of i think i think i said i say this i was talking to someone about this yesterday i was talking to this young athlete about about talent and how you know, t- talent always runs out eventually. And I've seen it, you know, happen multiple times where if talent is even a thing, let's say it is, um, you know, eventually if you don't work hard, it runs out and maybe it's, maybe it's in the first or second sport you try or, but if, if you find someone who consistently is diligent and works hard, thorough, listens to their coach, eventually they're going to achieve like success, maybe not in that sport, maybe in the next sport, maybe not in sport, maybe in business or, you know, in life or something, but eventually they're going to achieve like something pretty great. I think Mm -hmm. just like continue to really be driven. And, um, (laughs) yeah, there's, uh, I have a lot of other stories around that, but basically, yeah, that's, that's what I tend to think. Yeah. That's the absolute and best, best investment you can possibly make is in yourself and in actually giving your, yourself a chance to succeed. I couldn't agree more, man. So mm, yeah. I, I had a bunch more questions here, but we're s- starting to run out of time. So we may have to schedule a follow-up, but what I'm going to do is I've got a few rapid fire questions from some fans. So take as much time as you want to answer them. I'm just calling them rapid fires because they're, yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> this is from at Nitin. TP seven, what books, videos, or resources have you leveraged to gain your knowledge and awareness of this sport? And let, let's just say sport in general. Um, I think for this sport, as far as video resources, uh, you know, just YouTube and watching, I, I you know, I've told this to multiple people. Um, it, it is a new sport. And so even the even the instructional videos that are out there, there are some good ones. Don't get me wrong, but there's not a lot of good ones. Um, you know, you're going to, you're going to have a hard time to find more than, you know, three good videos on, I don't know, kipping ring dips or something, right. There's just, it's just not anyway. So what I would recommend for anyone who wants to get good at this sport is film yourself doing a movement, then watch video of someone who's very, a couple people that are very good at that movement competing, doing them in competition. So, you know, if it's ring muscle ups, you know, watch Cody Anderson and Camila Block Bazinet and compare and then try to figure out why you don't look like them. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's like the best and it takes time, but you're going to become your own coach and you're going to learn a lot by learning that way. So that's a huge one. And then, yeah, I mean, I, I, I need to make more and more time to read, um, uh, mental training books and stuff because I really have always found a lot of value from them. I like everything by Joshua Medcalf, like the book Chop Wood, Carry Water, and Burn Your Goals. Um, the Mindful Athlete by George Mumford, I come back to that occasionally. 
and the book The Art of Learning by Josh Watskin. Ooh, Waitskin, one of my favorites, man. Waitskin. Phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I really you know, I, I really enjoyed reading that book. I'm looking forward to kind of in the back of my mind one day when I start doing more coaching, especially young athletes. I intend to read that again and make some more thorough notes because I think there's a lot of cool cool things you can just uh yeah, hopefully instill in you know, look athletes that are more in like a blank state type situation where I mean some it was still a great book. Some of the lessons weren't as applicable to right. myself, but still some really valuable stuff. Yeah. From at Art Artem Kempi, how do you set your mind before competition? How do you handle stress and anxiety? Uh, that's obviously a you know that could be answered <laughs> quickly or shortly. Yeah, yeah. Carefully, the short answer. No. Um, uh, I mean, we we sort of tackled that a little bit. I think that. trying to think of the best way to answer that how do i set my mind you know interestingly enough um i do yeah i guess this is probably a good segue for that answer the games every year the last three years have been one of the lowest stress weekends of the year for me and the reason for that is because i'm so prepared and because i'm so busy all year especially in the last couple of years i've had a full-time job and training full time. So by the time I get to the games, I've done so much to prepare physically and mentally, and then, you know, making sure, you know, I actually get to not be on my email and, you know, talking to my, you know, coworkers and all this stuff that I'm like, you know, I'm actually like kind of go dark that the games is like a vacation. Um, obviously there's a lot of pressure and there's, it's like, you know, really hard and, you know, burpees hurt or whatever, but it's like the, least stressful weekend of the year for me because I'm so prepared. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, plan, prepare, think of all the things that could go wrong, make plan B's for all those things, you know, have all your food ready, have your coach ready, like just all those little things, you know, from where you're staying, all this stuff, dial it in. So by the time you get there, you really only have one job and that's just like to go out there and execute whatever plan you have. And yeah, that becomes, becomes like, kind of freeing and easy and then what we already talked about about releasing the outcome i think um yeah there's nothing nothing more stressful than going to a competition that matters and you want to do well and and you get there oh where's my my phone charger and oh i don't have enough food here and mm -hmm. i haven't got enough sleep like where are we going to go for dinner like all that crap it's like don't yeah have that have that stuff dialed in and if you do that and then on top of that have that you know release the outcome mentality we've already spoken about um you should be putting yourself in a pretty good place. Excellent answer. All I all I keep hearing you say though is execute, like some, like some Boston guy saying eggs are cute. Execute. I think it, <laughs> I think it's execute, but I don't know. I'm Canadian <laughs> word, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right. From at Ryan Renner, and this guy, this motherfucker is persistent. Brent, he sent probably 10 questions in. So I wanted to make sure we got at least one of this guy's questions. Uh, what do you wish you would have known coming into the sport? Hmm. Um, I think just the um, importance of having really good technique and not that I ever really had bad technique, but you know, if I just knew, if I was more and more diligent and thorough with, you know, how I picked up weight off the ground, learning how to brace properly, if I really, really dialed in like perfect squat mechanics, not just like, oh yeah, like, you know, below parallel and knees out. Um, and even just like proper, you know, shoulder position and pulling and pressing. Yeah, I think I would have saved myself. Like, I haven't had many injuries, but there's just been little bumps in the road that might have been eliminated. And some of that stuff you have to learn through, you know, through making those mistakes. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the biggest one is just, you know, like this, <laughs> this, this sport is, uh, it's dangerous. Like, I think, like, honestly, you know, it's fine. Like, it can be managed and I manage it and lots of other people do, but you know, picking up heavy weights off. And the, the interesting thing is in other, in other sports, like you choose the weights, right? Um, in this sport, it's like you go to a competition and they're like, it's 300 pounds. And like you either go home or you try to pick it up. 
<laughs> which is a little reckless. Right. Um, you know, and then just on top of all that, like this, there's just, you're just pushing your body through so many different ranges and like, you know, under fatigue. Yeah. It's like, you, I think that's the biggest thing is just understanding, like you have one body and like how you choose to move it is going to impact how you move forever and also forever as long as you're competing. And like, you know, every time you do something wrong, you have to do it right two times or three times to like fix that. Um, And just understanding that and really like respecting that process around quality movement. I wish I was even, and I was diligent, um, but I wish I knew even more because I think that, um, yeah, I think that's huge. I think people just want it all now. And I think, you know, I talked to, talked to some guys like, you know, good. And, you know, I want to, let's say like make it to a sanctioned event or make the games. I'm like, all right, well, like let's create a three year plan. Like, well, what do you mean three years? I'm like, I mean, I mean three years. And if it happens in two, that's great, but you need to start building. And like, that's what I'm trying to do. Like I want to win the games this year and that's what we're doing. We're, you know, me and, um, you know, the brute team and, you know, that's the plan is to try to win the games this year. But I'm also thinking about what does Brent look like in five years and training for that Mm -hmm. same time. And I think you can do both of those, but I think most people, yeah, I think it's, it's all about that, that long game and just doing everything, everything right. You know, it's like, Oh, my shoulder kind of hurts. Don't press today. Yeah. Yeah. Like, wow. Like there's a, there's like a million other things you can do. Like if it hurts to press, like maybe take a two day break until it's fine or just press and then it'll hurt forever. (laughs) Yeah. And it's not, it's not just a do this for your long-term health. This is actually one of the biggest competitive advantages you can have. If you're staying healthy while all of your competitors are getting hurt every year or two, you're going to make more improvements than they are period. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that, yeah, that's it, man. Yeah. I mean, I could go on and on about, but it's just like move better and take so much pride in that and understand that long-term it's going to matter far more than just, you know, putting five more pounds on the bar today. And then it looks, yeah. So yeah, that's it. (laughs) This one's from at Mark versus he wants to know why you made the switch to brute. And I would like to add, what was your thought process in picking a coach or a team? Um, and how can, how can other people learn from that process that you went through? Right. Um, so I was working with raw strength and conditioning for, I keep getting my years wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was four years. And like, we had a, we had a great run. Um, and we did like, we did it all. Um, and leaving, I think one of the things that I sort of came to this conclusion that, um, I just wanted a fresh set of eyes, not for really anything that was being done wrong. Uh, but more just, I look back, I think I mentioned this earlier in the podcast, uh, with my swimming coaches, every two, three years, I get a different coach and I'd learn something new. And I just felt like maybe it was time to do that again. And knowing I was moving to full-time athlete, I'd have more time to travel and the new sanctioned event schedule. I'd have to kind of be on top of things a little more all year. And I decided at the end of the games that I needed my off season to be a lot better this year. Last year's wasn't bad, but it felt like I'd sort of rolled through the motions for a couple months, just like, Oh, I'm getting stronger. Fine. And didn't really have that like aggression that you find like during the open when all of a sudden you have to win a bar muscle up or two weeks before regionals, you have to all of a sudden do handstand walk obstacle courses and the amount of progress you make when that sort of urgency exists. Mm -hmm. I wanted that urgency. And I thought I could partially create that with a new coaching staff and have this desire to sort of, you know, prove to them my worth. And there would be some energy, some new fresh energy from them, you know, like, trying to make me better. So that was sort of the decision making process to look for a new coach. Um, And I just, you know, I I looked around, honestly, I think that I think something I've learned recently is and even they talk about this in the art of learning a bit and the need to understand, you know, just because there there might be a great coach, like, for example, um, I won't go into details, but basically like, you know, Ben Bergeron and Catherine have a great relationship and they're doing great things together. I don't think Ben's the right coach for me, right? No slight on him or on me. It's just, I just, there's reasons in my mind that I think like, you know what, from like a, from a couple different ways, I don't think that his abilities are what I need to improve. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think you need to remember that 
you know, if like there's a certain way you like to train and a way you like to communicate and people you like to spend time with. I went to see this uh, massage therapist recently who I'd heard very good things about as far as their uh, abilities and their knowledge. Their personality was, I, c- I couldn't handle it. And so I was like, I can't, I can't go back to see that person. I don't care how good they are. They might be the best massage therapist in the world. Mm-hmm. Our energies, uh, if you want to call it that, did not vibe at all. And I thought I, I can never see that person again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, so I, I think that's a really good consideration. Um, yeah. Other than that, I think it's, um, yeah. So th- does that, does that answer the question? Sure. I don't know. Absolutely. Yeah. I've talked, you know, if you, if you want to hear more, I talked, cause it's, it's obviously I've been with Brute now for, uh, like two months ish, maybe even a little longer. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, things are going great. And if you want to hear more about that, I did talk more about it in other podcasts, one with the mind muscle project and one with arm and hammer on YouTube. And so if you really want it for more, I, I go into a little more detail cause it was a little more fresh then as far as like the reasons, but, um, yeah. Thank you, man. Do you have any, any like things that people can look out for any, any Mm -hmm. like pitfalls you see people falling into and picking a new program or even, even thinking about leaving their program? I think some people, I think a lot of people leave their program when they shouldn't. Yes. Yeah. So I think that, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I like that. Um, so the, the (laughs) funny thing with the, a program is there's sort of, there's sort of two things. And those, those two, those two questions are going to tie together here in a nice little way as though we planned it, which we didn't, <laughs> but the thing you should look for is someone with a plan. So it seems dreadfully obvious, but a lot of people in the CrossFit space uh, that are coaching or programming do not do this. And so what they should do is let's say, so if you're following a, if you're following a specialized program designed just for you, then this should definitely be happening. Um, And even if you're not, it should be happening in a generalized program as well, where you shouldn't be able to just like, in my opinion, at least jump in to a generalized program and just start doing these cool workouts. There should be a flow and a plan, even in a general program or a specialized one where it's like, hey, you know, this, this month, we're progressively loading your upper body pulling so that by the end of the month or the end of this six week block, you should be better at pulling because each week we're doing a little more, we're doing it a little heavier, maybe a little higher intensity. It's sort of like building up so that in six weeks, if you had a workout with like a bunch of pull-ups, you'd be more prepared than at the beginning of the six weeks. And that could be for, you know, squat strength, whatever, whatever. And so if you get a specialized program, you know, you can kind of, what you don't want to do is feed the just like if you're conducting a good interview with a job applicant you don't want to feed them the answer you want because a smart person is just going to answer it so a good business minded programmer if you ask them this in a certain way they're just going to say yes (laughs) um but what you want to determine you might even say like you got to find out what you know is holding you back from becoming better and then having some confidence that they have a structured program and a plan that's going to get you better at that in a, 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 an amount of time that seems reasonable. So if, if they say they can do it three weeks, they're probably wrong. But if they say three to six months or a year, then, you know, then they're probably being a little more accurate. So it's like, oh, you know, my, my squat strength is weak and, you know, my shoulder flexibility is bad and whatever, whatever, you know, understand that every day or two, those things need to be worked on. As you start seeing in your program that like, hey, I have these like four big problems and I feel like all week we kind of like just did cool workouts that were fun right. and like hard. But like, where's the, how, what, you know, why am I not like getting like, like proper, like stretching protocols for my shoulders all the time? And why am I not doing like a squat program? And if I'm doing a squat program to get stronger, why am I still doing all of this running and rowing and wall balls and lightweight thrusters? Like, you know, I, if, if the, the goal of my legs is to get them better at squatting, then basically when I'm using my legs, I'm squatting mm-hmm. and that's it because you're really needing to work on something that badly. Other things have to be put on the back burner. Right. And I just see a lot of people, I talk to a games athlete and uh, they're like, you know, I want to make it back. I'm like, all right, like, you know, what's the plan? Like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, like what's your and your programming plan? Oh, you know, we're just prepping for the open. 
okay. So I'm like, what do you, what do you need to work on? You know, the, the person mentioned a few things and I'm like, okay, well, you know, pick four things that like, like very specific things that you need to work on. And then maybe like eight things that are secondary. Right. And if you have those things and you make a plan for each one of those individual things, that's probably an entire week's worth of programming right there. There's probably no room for anything else. It is literally that simple. It, it's that, that, simple. that, that last piece, it, it can be literally that simple. I, I heard this new thing recently that fuzzy targets are never hit, right? If we don't, <laughs> if we don't get clear about what we're working towards, then we can't expect to land somewhere that we want, but we might, but we can't expect to. But if you get really clear about what you need to work on and create a plan for it, you have a much higher chance of reaching your goals. I love that. So I guess, and then, so I'll, I'll touch on that real quick and then I'll answer the second part of the question. So, so let's say, you know, this person was like, okay, I need to, you know, be better at rowing, uh, front squats, repetitive strict pulling, and um, I don't know, burpees or something, you know, like a front squat program could be like, you know, three hard days of squatting variants a week with some glued accessories and then rowing. I mean, you can row and maybe do some like, you know, maybe like ski erging or something to uh, contrast it, you know, again, like three days a week of like specific intervals. And that's not just like doing workouts with rowing in it. That's like on the rower getting sweaty for as long as you need to for an hour's worth of intervals. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, like, you know, pulling mechanics. And then with the pulling, you need to do a little bit of pressing to combat that. Um, and before you know it, that's like a solid two hour, three hours a day, five, six days a week of work, mm -hmm. you know? And then on top of that, maybe there's like some handstand skills and some muscle up turnover and some wrist flexibility or whatever. And then you add in those little things that are secondary and then it's like you have your program. And so to leave a coach, if oh, someone's thinking of leaving, one, if you're not doing that, then find someone who is leave. Mm -hmm. Two, if you feel like that is happening, you need to wait and see it out. I see some people leave too early and they're like, oh, this program didn't work. And it's like, well, you've only been doing it, you know, a month or two. Or I love I love this even more. They'll leave, um, and I won't mention any names, but if you, people might guess what I'm thinking about. But if you leave, and then all of a sudden you start getting PRs, like oh, like this new, like, uh, the new program I'm doing is so great, and they start smashing PRs. Like that was probably just the old program. Right. Just you're reaping the rewards from it. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, like some people will do these really difficult, like um, like powerlifting programs. And then, you know, they finish the program, they don't PR, and they're like, oh, it's, that's bull. And then they'll do like an easier program. And then two, three weeks later, they're going to PR everything and they're going to yeah. go, oh, it's this new program. <laughs> like, no, like this easier program is essentially the deload. And you finally have the super compensation from all that hard work you like barely survived. Right. And maybe you can't do all that like hard, really, really hard powerlifting program all year, but it worked, you know? And yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> So Another yeah, it's, super yeah. common one, maybe not at the elite level. I'm not sure, but definitely at novice and intermediate levels is do like get getting on a really good program, but not doing all of it, right? Skipping certain things. Sometimes people might skip a lot of the recovery work or the active recovery, or they might skip some of the technique work and they're missing huge portions of what makes uh, a cohesive program. And then they blame it on the entire program. That's another huge pitfall that I see people fall into. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, see, I don't do that, so I it doesn't. I don't have a frame of reference for that. But What's but yeah, that? so if you don't have time, yeah, so if you don't have time to do it, then you need to find a, another program that you do have time for, right? Because it's all it's all together, and so you know you need that active recovery or those accessories to make the rest of it make sense. Hopefully, if it's an actual like cohesive program, it's not just nonsense thrown together. Um, but yeah, if it's an actual like planned program, you know, you might need all those upper back accessories because you're doing all that pressing. And then if you don't do them and you hurt your shoulders and you blame the program, it's like, well, actually, if you did all that upper back accessory and a bit of that cool down work that we programmed, you wouldn't be injured and you'd just be stronger. So yeah, blaming the program when you're not following the program is, yeah, it's maybe no not good. the best strategy. It's no good, guys. <laughs> yeah. All right, man, this has been phenomenal. I've kept you way too long. Before we get out of here, tell me about the professor project. What are you doing? Are you, are you teaching courses online? Are you, are you oh. teaching at a university? What, what is the professor project? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so it's it's a uh, it's an in person university. Um, it's like McDonald's University. No, I'm kidding. Oh uh, yes. <laughs> so basically, the idea here was, you know, there's some good programs out there. I'm not trying to compete with that. I just wanted to have a, you know, a high level competitive resource, and not even competitive, but a, you know, even general CrossFit knowledge resource that people um, hopefully uh, can trust. And I think that there's, it's either one of two things. One, people feel like they don't know where they can find really good help, really good information. Um, or two, there's so much of it that they don't know what they can trust. And so my, my goal was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very good at CrossFit and, you know, people know that and I'm thorough and mindful and, you know, thoughtful in my approach to it. And I wanted to provide sort of what I've learned and things that I think will help sort of the beginner to, to even the elite CrossFitter improve and a lot of, a lot of stuff on movement. So, you know, like technique on how to climb, there's like a 30 minute video on how to climb a rope properly um, with all these things that I haven't seen really coached anywhere else. And then everything from a, and then I have another video that's again, like 20 or 30 minutes on how to prep for a competition. So, you know, everything I do, I have like spreadsheets and word documents I use before regionals to fill in on like what I'm wearing and how I'm preparing and what I'm warming up and, you know, why I'm doing certain things and my mindset and my cool down, what food I'm eating and why, and just all the things I do to prepare for a competition and, you know, hopefully allowing people and people already have and really enjoyed it, um, adopt those same sort of mentalities to professorize their own uh, CrossFit journey. Yeah. Boom. Okay. <laughs> Professor. Um, yeah. Just try, trying to get people more mindful. And it's been cool. There's been some uh, before the podcast started, I mentioned a conversation that, you know, we had on our, like we have a community and we all converse online and ask questions to each other. And, you know, the one guy said, Hey, you know, I watched this video and of you doing strict pull-ups in this pull-up progression. And, you know, I filmed myself and then I did them the way you said and realized I haven't really been doing strict pull-ups. And these were like, way harder than what I've been doing. And I realize now why I haven't been making progress. And it's just, you know, he came to this realization that, you know, that he wouldn't have come to otherwise uh, this like, like, Oh, I, you know, I was doing strict ish pull-ups, but not doing them really well. And, you know, why is that? And how do I get better at that? And him just asking those questions is, you know, super valuable and really cool that, you know, it sparked that within him. And yeah, so it's just this place where people can learn and it's kind of everything but a program. I just envision people, you know, going to a gym somewhere, uh, somewhere in the world and they don't have access to, you know, they, they're like, well, what does it take? Like, uh, like, you know, I want to do, I want to be better at this. And I feel like what I have directly in front of me, as far as, you know, maybe my gym and my coaches isn't enough for what I need to know. Mm -hmm. And is a source of a source of truth uh, or at least my my truth my version of the truth an explanation on um, what i think works and you know trying to get better together that's super valuable man and like you said that's this is not something that uh is very available if if at all to people this this very thorough explanation of how to think about how to strategize how to prepare yourself um you're filling in a huge need in the crossfit industry yeah, thanks, man. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, it's been fun. People have people have been getting better, and yeah, I think um, you know, just the commitment, you know, just uh, just the commitment to it, and just the thought of being more thoughtful, even without all my help, has helped people. And then mm -hmm. the help I've given has also helped. You know, it's yeah, it's been it's been good. It's yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Now you don't have to answer this because your paying customers might be offended if you if you give away your secrets. But Pat Vellner said you don't wear underwear while you compete. Can you confirm or deny that? <laughs> did he actually say that? No, he did it. He did it. Oh, okay, I was like, what? No, I definitely, I definitely wear underwear. Sometimes I wear two pairs. Um, but yeah, yeah, that could come with some obvious advantages. All right, Brent, you're the fucking man. I appreciate you, brother. Anything, uh, any, th any last words? No. Um, yeah. Treat people well and keep working hard and don't put limits on what you're capable of. Love it. Where can they find you? Uh, Instagram, you know, the old Graham, Brent Fikowski, or sorry, it's at Fikowski. Jeez, Brent. Um, I have a website too. If you want to check that out, Brent And yeah. And then obviously, you know, the professor project on Instagram and 
yeah, Facebook and Twitter, I'm there too, but I don't really do as much on there. So mostly, mostly Instagram is where it's at. And then just my website, you can, there's some more info on there. And yeah. Hashtag professorize. Thank you, brother. Have a great day, man. Thank you. Hey, if you're interested in getting better at gymnastics, you want to get your first pull up, you want to get more pull ups, you want to get your first muscle up, you want to do more muscle ups, you just want to get better at gymnastics, we have an awesome video series for you. So our gymnastics doctor, Nick Sorrell, created a three part video series where he covers program design. So the first video is on program design, and this is how we program for our athletes. And and he teaches it in a way that makes it immediately useful to you in getting better at gymnastics. He goes over what he calls the big eight. So these are the highest yield exercises that if you do nothing else with your gymnastics skill sessions, if you do these eight, this will get you the majority of the results that you're looking for. And finally, he did, he goes over something he calls the capacity formula. And this is a way to assess yourself and find your weak points, your, your biggest weaknesses in your gymnastics skill level. And he talks about how to use that information in a way that can help you grow and improve your skills and capacity in gymnastics as quickly as possible. And this is a free video series that we offer and you can get access to it by going to brutestrengthtraining.com backslash GSL, brutestrengthtraining.com backslash GSL. So it's a three-part video series. He covers program design, the big eight, and the capacity formula. Hope you enjoy. This episode is finished, but your training journey continues. Head over to BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW and grab your free pack of 32 accessory workouts that you can incorporate into your training and start improving your strength immediately. That's BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW.